No mai hara mai kia tau mai ki tēnei wāhanga um, ko Oaha Live. Ngā mahi mahana kia koutou katoa i tēnei rā. Ko Sandra Julian aho, ko Ngati Motunga, Ngati Tama, Pautama, Metia Tiawa, Oku Iwi, no Taranaki. Kia ora and welcome to episode 16 of Oaha Live. I appreciate that you are here with us today. I'm your host, Sandra Julian. I'm the founder of Oaha, a business event agency and a proved professional conference organizer. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Oaha Live. Please don't be shy, drop some comments in, join the conversation, ask the questions. If we don't get to you during our live session today, we will definitely come back and answer your questions in the comments. Um, during the sessions, uh, I am interviewing the many talented people who work behind the scenes of the business events industry in Aotearoa. And in these sessions, it, they are designed to provide you some insight to what goes on behind the scenes when delivering a business event. It is my hope that you will take away a nugget of value from these sessions and use this information to level up the business events that you're involved in. My guest today is a professional MC, keynote speaker, performance artist and event consultant. He has presented or performed more than 1,000 events. Like that's an incredible number. Um, and he's done that in over 35 countries around the world. Again, phenomenal. So I'd like to introduce you to my guest today, who is Greg Ward. Greg, welcome to Oaha Live. Kia ora and kia ora nui mō tō te reo. Uh, just beautiful, what a wonderful way to start. Uh, ko Pukatauturu te monga, ko uh, Manga Tawhiri te awa, ko Ngati Pake Ate Iwi, ko Air New Zealand DC-8 in 1972, Toku Waka, ko Greg Warder Hou. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, Greg. New Zealand I'm an import. <laughs> That's great. Love it. Um, thanks for joining us here today. Uh, I'm like I was. You were on my wish list to get you onto the show because during this lockdown period, I saw your studio evolve into this amazing like production center. So we'll get to talk about that all in a minute. But let's start by maybe just giving a bit of a backstory to everyone on what has led you to this point in your career. Uh, thanks, uh, Sandra. I'm, I'm absolutely uh, pleased as punch to be here. Uh, I've, I've seen your series going on and, and I've been very envious. <laughs> and so, so having the opportunity to come and join you on here is absolutely brilliant. Um, so uh, potted history. Uh, my career path has been anything but uh, a straight line. Uh, yeah. I've done a, what feels like a million things over the course of um, my career, and every single one of them has lent itself to exactly what I'm doing right now. So mm -hmm. starting as a kid, as uh, performing in school plays and shows, uh, singing and uh, training, uh, learning musical instruments and the like, uh, which led on to bands in my uh, teens, uh, and at the same time, I was I was always mindful that I should have a real job, <laughs> and so <laughs> I kept on forcing away or pushing away this this burning need to perform or to get on stages, and uh, I got a lot of different skills in different areas and ended up joining the military of all things. Uh, mm. So I spent four years in the army and the Royal New Zealand Signals, I learned a lot about communications. And almost immediately after I got out, I traveled across to Europe. Now we would immigrated to New Zealand when I was three years old. And until that point, I was staunchly British. <laughs> and then I got to the UK. And after my time in the UK, um, I realized where my heart was. And that was right mm -hmm. here in Aotearoa. And so that for me was a real recognition. But while overseas, I had some further performance opportunities, was signed to a record company in, in London, uh, performed around a number of different clubs. And again, you're continually gaining experience in front of audiences. Uh, returning to New Zealand, still going for the real job. I was working in IT. And again, I've got a, yeah. a technical bent. So I quite enjoyed mm -hmm. that process of learning, troubleshooting, logical flow. 
uh, and at the same time started really training on the performance side. And that's when I really realized that what I wanted was to be on the stage. So trained for three years as an actor using the Meisner technique, seven years of opera uh, musical theater training as a singer mm -hmm. and toured with opera around uh, New Zealand and Australia. Um, continued to grow as a musician. Uh, so picked up the piano, started doing Elton John impersonations and tributes with that. <laughs> Then came across this wonderful thing that we call the business events industry, mm. which I was really not aware of until probably the early part of the 2000s. And in that moment, I uh, partnered actually with um, what is now BEIA, but there was then SINS, yeah. to provide some performance entertainment with a colleague uh, in return for a stand at meetings. And <laughs> that moment, I just saw how big this industry was. And shortly after that, I was hosting uh, one of the, the SINs conferences and TNZ were there presenting about the business activity survey. And mm. I couldn't believe it. There's this, you know, the information, three and a half thousand associations of which many do a multi-day conference more than two days and more than a hundred delegates. And I realized that there was not enough people of my ilk to be able to service even a portion of that. And so the market was so huge. Uh, it was this beautiful treasure trove of opportunity. Yeah. So I began learning how to run a business and became, uh, for, well now, it's for a fairly well recognized MC performer. 25% mm -hmm. of my work's in the Australian market and uh, mm -hmm. the majority majority's here and some stuff further afield. Uh, it's been a, been a wild ride. <laughs> <laughs> and so, Keynote speaking and being an MC, is that kind of evenly spread? You know, how, how, what no, kind of that, business mix up of like performance now? The, well, the vast majority of the work that I've done and continue to do is as an MC. So mm. that first process will get me generally in the door and generally I'll do a, a, a good job for the client, the client will be very happy, and we'll renegotiate and do another year. And what I find is that once you have performed as an MC annually, twice, there's a high likelihood that you're going to retain that client for a considerable amount of time. Now, when you're working with the same client over and over again, you have to innovate because mm. you can't do the same thing twice. You can't just keep on going back and expecting to get the same result because you get a diminishing return. Plus, as a performer or as a, as a platform professional, you need to grow. And the only mm -hmm. way you're going to grow is by being innovative and finding new ways to not only support your client, but also to keep yourself stimulated uh, along that process. So the mm -hmm. keynoting has only recently come into the fore, actually, in the last two years oh. or so. Uh, prior to that, I would certainly do keynotes on various aspects, but it wasn't the core focus. And I'm very mindful that it's very easy to stand on a stage and talk for a considerable amount of time about a subject but you might have just exhausted everything you know in that one presentation. And that's not really what you need as a keynote speaker. You want to be a, a subject expert. Now, I, with the work I've done, have become a subject expert in this role, emceeing, live, yeah. virtual, digital, however you want, want to call it. Yeah. Uh, and the keynoting is still on its growth phase. So it's, um, it's exciting. It's interesting. It's, yeah. uh, it's wonderful opportunities. Nice. So 25% in Australia and like 75% here with a scattering around the world. What, what yep. is that, that? How did you, how did you manage to like build the divide of that, you know, across the ditch and getting into those events? Cause sometimes it, it can be, it can be difficult because event organizers and associations, they want local. So some of the events might travel around and they have a local committee and they want to do as much local as they can. So to then get you, you know, 25% of your business being in Australia, that's, mm -hmm. that's like a decent chunk of, of business. So how does, how does that happen or how does that um, work when you're based here? Well, that's a, uh, the story actually of, of how all this came about was – I was asked to do a conference by an Australian client who cold called me from Google, just searched me somehow, got a hold of me and said, hey, you are, we're doing this event in Queenstown. Can you MC it? Uh, so, of course, I'm going to say yes. Uh, yeah. So I put a bit of a um, 
proposal together quickly and sort of sent it across to the the uh, uh, the client just to basically say that I was available for the dates and so forth, uh, and that I w he was based in Sydney. So I said I'm j I just happen to be in Sydney um, next week, and I'm wondering if I can catch up with you. And he said, Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, so I got off the phone and booked a flight. Uh, because I wasn't going to say, um, I had no intention yeah. of going to Australia, uh, but this was too good an opportunity to pass up. And so I spent about a grand in total uh, on that one opportunity to fly across to Sydney, turn up at their office, have a uh, maybe three quarter of an hour conversation with them in the office, um, walk out, try and catch some, some more potential clients while I was there and come home same day. And that experience for them showed me it showed them that i was accessible and that i was mm -hmm. quite prepared to do what i wanted to do they didn't know that i wasn't going to be in sydney and i yeah. wasn't until it was only a couple of years later that i told them but that <laughs> one opportunity that turned into another opportunity uh with the same client but also i i do this technique which i call spider webbing so within that group of people there's going to be other organizations that require the services of a professional mc so it's my job um, to ensure that they're going to get a professional MC and I'll do whatever I can to, to sell the services. And so I started working with another range of Australian clients based on that first client and that mm. spread out and spread out and I can track very large amounts of money back to that one particular client over what is now 15 years of, mm. uh, of, of work. And then I started getting work in, off the back of that, uh, I started connecting in the meetings trade show uh, with uh, particularly and specifically with Australian clients or potential right. clients. And that generated further business in the Australian market. And so I started getting a range of both corporates and association work. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's been further bolstered by uh, an association with uh, OSSE. So that's yeah. given me further connection, further exposure to that market. And I continue to work pretty much always on a partnership basis. And it's always been my ethos uh, that, that I do a thing called a triple win, which is the client wins, I win, and the event itself wins. And that's in, the, in its entirety, including sponsors, delegates, and all that go with it. And, and I approach the market with that ethos because it's, mm. about, it's about you. It's always, about, it's always external. Mm. An MC's role is hospitality. It's really about you. So whatever I can do for you, that's it's what I'm going to do. Uh, and it's stood me in very good stead. Yeah. And I think that's where I think our industry it is always about you. Like our industry in New Zealand, the business events industry in New Zealand, everyone that I work with, it's always about you. We're here to serve the client. We're here to you know, make the delegate feel comfortable. We're here to create the experience. We're here to, um, which is what I really love about what we do here. Like I, I don't have a huge amount of experience working offshore because I've made a conscious effort to stay onshore here in Aotearoa. So I don't have a huge experience of what others are like other than, you know, things that you hear around the grapevine. Um, but definitely in New Zealand, I think our business events industry is always focused on it's about you. What is it that we can help you do, you achieve, and you be the best that you can be? How do we shine a light on you? So yeah, I love that. That's how you've been able to win over, um, you know, Australian clients as well as New Zealand clients. But I love that story around just getting on a plane going to Sydney, but you know, best thousand bucks you ever could have spent if you can track that back yeah. 15 years worth of business, you know? Well, and that's, it's not a isolated case either. I mean, those, those kind of opportunities do come up fairly frequently and it's how we react to them as yeah. business owners and, uh, and how connected we are to uh, who we are and what we want. Yes. So the, another ex experience of this was with, a Swiss-based organization that were looking for an MC um, for their world conference. So th very luckily, the CEO of this organization was an expat New Zealander um, ah. who had, happened to have been traveling around and had seen me in three different locations presenting for, an, for engineering clients. And he just mentioned casually at, at a dinner on one of those nights, he said, I'm just trying to pitch you in front of a thousand delegates in Barcelona. 
And, uh, I, and I said, I'd love to. I'd love that'd be great. And it was kind of a, like a throwaway kind of thing. And he, and he just said, oh, well, you know, like if you want, if you like, you know, why don't you put a pitch in? So I got home from that particular conference. The next day I hired a television studio. I hired a Spanish speaker to translate a piece for me. And then I learned it verbatim and uh, presented it straight down the barrel of a camera direct to the audience saying how much I would really enjoy to be their MC. And I know that I'm from the other side of the world, but I'm really passionate about language. And I'm talk passionate about these things. Uh, that went to the committee. Uh, went, we, I was shortlisted down to three, then down to two, and then I got the job. And wow. uh, I flew to Barcelona, did the job, and it wasn't until, again, probably a couple of years later, I, I asked uh, the gentleman uh, why I got it. And he said that the other individuals were more cost-effective, but I wanted it more. Oh. And... And it was the drive and the passion to actually do that, um, yeah. uh, which is absolutely brilliant. And and he's back in New Zealand now. And so it's in, in yeah. Vic, and he's back here in New Zealand. And the organization was FIDIC, the International Federation of Consulting Engineers. So I, yeah. I, I thank Enrico extremely for the wonderful opportunity that he afforded me. Yeah. And so was was that before video became kind of a normal place in marketing? Because video has really become really prevalent as more social media has taken over um, our everyday lives. But was that in an era when video wasn't such a common place? Video was being used. I mean, people were, were very you know, strongly aware that imagery has so much more impact than simply words. So we, it, it, but it wasn't. I I hadn't seen anyone do that. hadn't seen anybody do a, a video pitch, and it, it was a combination of factors because I knew the TV studio it was the Face Television Studio in Auckland, and I knew the facility they had, and all of those factors they they create these little points of connection, where you where you can see the vision of what you want, and then create it you know, using whatever tools you have or whatever skill you have to match that vision you have in your, in your head. Mm -hmm. And it's an, it's a, it's a challenging thing to do. Uh, but mm -hmm. that's, that experience has certainly cemented for me, the power of video, being able to yeah. connect with people down the barrel of the camera. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. And so how much of your MCing do you bring in your performance elements? So opera and and a bit of that, um, you know, play performance that you did early career. How much do you now bring that into what you do as an MC? I generally bring it into almost every event that I do mm -hmm. for events that are things like awards nights. Uh, they, are, they often have a, a performance element to them. And it's a really good way of being able to take some of the formality or the stuffiness out of an awards event while at the same time ensuring that the status remains high because mm. the work that i do with an audience is is uh improvisational and and interactive but it's not crass or silly or you know it's designed for a corporate audience for an association kind of feel so that mm -hmm. there's a if there's anybody who's getting uh, made fun of it's me it's always coming back to 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 that angle uh and i will almost always do it as a reveal so that if i'm working with a new client that they have no concept of of the backstory that i have or the skills that i can bring to that event and then you just reveal it sort of layer by layer which gives you longevity as well because it gives as see you've got this great skill set and a grab bag that you've learned over many many years you can just keep on revealing portions of it and then mm -hmm. tweaking that to suit the client because it's very important that you need to tailor to ensure that the client is receiving the specific stuff that they need. You mm -hmm. can't this is you can't recycle something verbatim and use it in front of an, uh, another client. Yeah. And so that won't work. But uh, it's an, a really cool experience having to sit down and think about how are we mm. going to do this one? What's this one going to be like? Yeah, nice. And so how much work goes in for you pre-event? Quite a bit. Uh, the mm. starting point for me is in the, obviously in the pitch. 
um, mm -hmm. getting the getting all the pitch documents together, getting it off, off to a client, and at the at the point of being booked, it's then the process of going, how can I understand you deeper? So I'll ask them mm -hmm. to provide me with subscriptions to the in-house magazines or industry magazines uh, digitally, so that I can have as much information, what I call coming in by osmosis. So it's like when you're doing a test, right? So if you're doing an exam, you are never going to cram that exam and win it, before, you know, the night before. So yeah. to get an understanding of the culture of an organization and the feel and the various players in it, then you have to do it drip by drip. So over mm -hmm. time, I do delving into pieces, write a little piece. Uh, I'm reviewing the overall structure of the event. And that's where the, ex the experience comes in as well, is that sometimes I look at run sheets, uh, particularly where people aren't using event managers or PCOs, and mm -hmm. you'll go, yeah, that's not going to work. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that sense of you can see the timings, you know the venue, you know the location, you know how long it's going to take somebody to go from here to here with the, yeah. uh, the two minutes of idle chat that's going to happen somewhere else. And you look at timings and go, you've made a program that's not physically physically possible and it's just mathematics simple basic maths how can we make it so that you have more and deeper engagement for your clients mm. the way you do it is in the in that conference design and you know this in yeah. spades i mean this is a a, yeah. a integral part of why uh, you have so much value in what you do it's the mm. and it's a lot of that is quite the thinking behind it is often quite hidden because nobody really gets it until yeah. you do this <laughs> yeah and like i call it a delegate footprint so when we're designing the event is what is the delegate footprint from the moment they enter the door to the moment they exit the door and how are they navigating their way around all of the elements in your event so it makes logical sense and it walks them through a storyboard so yeah so i call it the delegate footprint so how are they getting from here to here what are they experiencing during the time and when they're going from session to break from break to session from session to session how long does it's going to take them to walk out the door up the stairs in the door find a seat chat to the next you know so it's like it's all yep. of that that has to go into the timing of a program and that's how i that's how i look at it yeah i'm with you completely with you on that my mm -hmm. whole experience in venues is is I will physically walk the floor. I will I will do exactly what I'm expecting the delegate will do, and mm -hmm. then uh, revising elements along the way. Because uh, often, uh, so one of the one of the challenges that I have as an MC or had as an MC, it's not so much these days, is that the MC would often be an afterthought because mm -hmm. people didn't necessarily value the skill set that an MC would bring to an event, yeah. and it's generally you're trying to sell the value to a client before they've had the value and yeah. that's a really hard push but once they've done it it's a it's a like a it's switch no of key. Yeah. absolutely they're like oh why didn't we do this years ago that comment yeah. i could have bottled that comment a, you know, yeah. a thousand times yeah. uh but that's that it is that that experience of getting onto the floor knowing exactly how it runs making the the tweaks as necessary and ensuring that those sponsors get the love they need mm. yeah and put in the program in the right places because sometimes that those speaker the speaker acknowledgements and the sponsor acknowledgements if they're put in the wrong place in the program for the mc just falls dead has little impact yeah so it's that whole yep. what is being spoken from stage what is being directional what it, yeah that whole piece comes into it so it's interesting to say you, you know what the difference you get from working with a pco and working with a non-pco and the the contrast and what you get as an mc interesting thing is they actually see the value in an mc <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And you know what, this year, or I should say last year, uh, certainly has changed certain sectors of the um, Association Institute market uh, mm. significantly, like organisations that would predominantly never use an MC, uh, realising that in a digital setting, it's critical that they have somebody who's got the ability to connect with audiences down the barrel of a camera and live mm. because of the, the nature of, you know, we're either live, live digital or hybrid. Yeah. So this is a skill set that is not within those organizations currently. Mm. 
uh, which mm. has led to some significant market opportunities. Okay, so let's go to March, this time last year, when the world went into lockdown, all us PCOs had a big freak because all of our contracts got, you know, we're out, it was cancelled 100%. MCs, speakers, anyone involved in live events, tech, themers, everybody, it just went, doors are shut. Tell me what it looked like in your world March last year. Well, I'm going to start in late February last year mm. because I had this little inkling, and it, and it was not wasn't because I I'm in some kind of you know profit. <laughs> uh, it was because I had a client who had been looking around the world because they were looking at bringing a number of uh, uh, international speakers to their conference for 2020, and had seen what COVID was doing. So I had this meeting where I turned up about five minutes late into a virtual meeting. So we turned up on, on Zoom. We'd been using Zoom for a, uh, a couple of, about, for about a year, actually, a, a, for the occasional meeting. And I heard the convener say, and that's why we're going to cancel the conference. And uh, that, that was the first thing I heard on, uh, in the room. And so I listened for a little bit longer as there was sort of information that's going around. And I had my turn to speak. And I says, no, don't cancel it. We'll just go virtual. And then I blithely rattled off how we could potentially make this, take a three-day conference, turn into a one-day um, symposium, uh, cut all of the 45s down to um, 15s uh, with lots of Q&A, connection, inter interactivity, and so forth. I was making this up. I was literally making it up. Um, I hadn't done that. I'd never done it. I was thinking to myself, this is, the, but I'm, I, I'm not going to lose this client. It was my thought <laughs> process. <clears throat> so it was a, a lot of that same sort of process of, you know, filming a Spanish speaking piece. So, uh, and the convener said, wow, love it. This sounds really good. Let's explore this. Go, let's, let's do it. So we started that process of exploring. Uh, and the conference wasn't going to be till later in the year. So we left it there. And then I went to Australia for a convention, which was the Professional Speakers Australia convention. Got there and started receiving phone calls. And that was on the 13th of March. And mm. then we've got phone calls on the 14th of March. And we, as professional speakers in, the, in this convention, are all looking at each other and going, what are we doing? What's happening? Everyone's fielding calls with cancellations constantly. Uh, till the 15th, Got to the 15th of March and the conference was scheduled for another two days and I just pulled the plug. Uh, flights were virtually impossible to get. People were trying to travel all over the place. Um, paid $1,000 to come back home on a <laughs> New Zealand uh, regular seat. Um, uh, but got back to New Zealand and went into 14 days of quarantine. So uh, I was, I'd was i arrived just before the end of the actual lockdown, but uh, I couldn't guarantee where I'd been or who I'd seen. So I spent 14 days in this room, actually, that we're currently in right uh, now. My wife was wonderful. She just she brought meals out to me here. Um, we went for walks at night. Uh, I would walk two metres behind the family <laughs> when we walked down the streets. Uh, but it was, it was an incredibly cathartic time. Every single booking, mm -hmm. every single piece of business were those were those either cancelled or pushed out to 2021, and a lot of those have been pushed out to 2022 now. So by the end of March, I had zero work, no opportunities, mm -hmm. and looking towards the future going, what are we doing? What? Yeah. But at the same time, weirdly, with that loss of all of the work, came this incredible sense of no more responsibility. <laughs> I didn't have to do the work because there's no work there. So if there's no opportunity to make money, and if there's no work, what does that leave? It leaves time, and it leaves a, a, a space that I hadn't had in my mind for a long time, because you're constantly working, mm -hmm. right? You go from event to event to event. Mm -hmm. it's the, mm -hmm. the same old, you're on, you're on that treadmill, you're going to keep working because that's your business. Mm -hmm. But I had time. And so I went, okay, so if we're going to talk about this virtually, and that's what it's, what it's going to look like, what are we going to do? So. I had I didn't have any of a webcam at that point. So I, I called up a mate of mine who just happens to be one of uh well, was at the time the CEO of one of New Zealand's largest computer retailers. And he dropped over his own personal webcam in my letterbox, uh, an old 720p um, Logitech cam. So I got that up there. I needed lighting, so I found an old garage light that I had in the garage, you know, the old cage light kind of thing. And I rigged that up on a stand directly in front of front of me. Uh, I went, didn't go to Spotlight. I rang Spotlight and got them to deliver 
to me uh, 16 metres of lime green cotton fabric at $10.99 a metre and threw that up a couple of um, speaker stands that I had over the back. Jerry rigged it all up. And thankfully, from an audio side, because as a musician, I, I have a fair amount of audio gear, uh, I have uh, compressors and noise gates and mixers and uh, high-quality voice microphones because I do voiceovers too. Yeah. So that audio side was set, but right. the rest of it I had to suddenly build. Yeah. Uh, but even just using those very limited tools, I had a wonderful call from uh, a guy called Julian Lefebvre, who's in Australia, who I'd worked with about six years with the um, Health Informatics New Zealand Digital Health Week. Yeah. And he would do the online portion of the event, and I would be doing the live portion of the event as the mm -hmm. MC. And we'd gone a little bit deeper in, in over years and created a TV studios and all sorts of different things. Um, uh, that's uh, Kim Mundell, who's the CEO, incredibly forward thinking, just wonderful organization. And he called me up and said, uh, Greg, what are you doing? Uh, I've got an event that you might want to do some work for. Can you do a virtual event? I says, no problem. So I did this, exactly what we're doing here. Set it up, got myself green screen, backgrounds, and and turned up looking like I meant business. And that mm -hmm. one event has turned and spawned many more. And uh, I'm now working with a number of different clients uh, that I've connected through Julian and, and through uh, JPL Media and Gig TV uh, and other sources and have ended up Becoming quite well known in the Australian market, uh, worldwide market, and New Zealand market as a professional virtual MC. Uh, and as we're starting to see this year, uh, we're starting to get a bit more live coming through. So that's that's coming back in, and I've you know, got a lot of inbound inquiry, which is always good. But mm. 2020, incredibly hard. Um, we consider ourselves very fortunate at running at roughly 60% of what we turned over in 2019. Mm. And that's tough. Uh, yeah. it's, and I, I say I'm very fortunate because I know of colleagues in the industry, uh, organisations who have not made it through and who yeah. are still on that edge right now, or others who are still on the edge right now. And that, if that's one thing that we as an industry are so desperate for is some kind of governmental support for what we see as being this, this industry which is so critically important to uh, New Zealand's economy. Mm, yeah, I agree. I mean, I'm surprised that the amount of suppliers that are still in some capacity operating in the business events industry. Um, we've been a, a resilient bunch of people who have managed to I would say hop our way through um, and and be quite diverse and think outside the box as to what are we doing in our business during this time. But the other thing that I've seen people say too is, do I want to be here? Is this an industry that I want to be in? Because now is my opportunity to rethink what I'm doing. And and so I know a few businesses too have had that thought. Do I want to stay or do I want to go? And yeah, and so I've I've been completely in awe of those businesses who have had to reinvent themselves and had to think outside the box in order to stay. But I think it's been a good thing because sometimes we can get stuck in this is what I do because this is what I've always done. But having the yeah. space to go okay, that's what I've always done, but is that really what I want to do? Or can I evolve into my next phase of business? And what does that look like? So it has been super interesting watching the business events industry go through this. But yeah, I, and that's why I started Awaha Live, because I felt like we were the industry, the hidden industry. It's no one really saw what we do in a business events industry, people go to conferences and they go to events, but do they actually realize the level of production and the livelihood of people and small businesses and families that live behind the business events industry that had no way of recovering itself while COVID was still, you know, a possibility. So 
Yeah, it's been extremely difficult. And yeah, more government support for those businesses who just haven't had the ability like you and I to come into a virtual world um, would have been would have kept our industry strong because once the gates open again the challenge for us here is do we have an industry that can support those international conferences coming in and if we don't have an industry to support them coming in then that's just that takes the whole economy away and we have to like start from scratch again so yeah more government support would have been great you know, in specific targeted areas rather than blanket um, approach for sure. All right, Completely. what I would love to do now that I'm off my high horse, <laughs> I would love for you to give people a look at your studio because oh, sure. this is what blew me away. I'm like, oh my gosh, Greg, you like that's high tech. Look at that, people. Like this is Greg's studio. How many laptops is that, Greg? One, two. There's uh, in the shot that you can see right now. There is uh, there's two in the centre there. Behind the screen, which is just underneath the microphone, uh, behind that screen to the left hand side of it is another oh, yeah. uh, laptop, which is a uh, device that I tend to use as, as a screen recorder to ensure that whatever I stream out is actually what's going out and what's what's being received by a client. Uh, and then directly to my left, I've got another machine which is designed as a uh, PowerPoint machine, which will provide you know, a range of well, imagery or, or video, whichever I want, to be able to place into these scenes. And the camera that you we're currently viewing this on right now is a uh, it's just an iPad. So that's up on a um, on a stand, and it's connecting into my system via a thing called the NDI, which is a, a network interface, which allows you to use your internal uh, network um, to connect with uh, relatively low latency, uh, which is a, a really nice little tool. Mm. Uh, the screen to the right of my central laptop is a secondary monitor, so that gives me the ability to uh, review what's uh, what, what we're actually doing at this particular point in time, or I can place pretty much anything on that uh, screen. Laptop down just directly in front of me is my business laptop, which covers all the whatever's coming up next and uh, all the, the angles, but it often is used as a media machine as well. So when I'm doing live streaming, I can use that machine to send video to the uh, 18 Mini Pro. And that's, I'll just move my cup out of the way. And the 18 Mini Pro is this little device here. Right. Oh, we can see there. That's a uh, broadcast studio switcher. So that gives me the ability to take four different um, HDMI sources and turn them into a single stream within the system that I'm using. And what I'm using right now is OBS, which is open source mm. broadcast software. And mm -hmm. this gives a, you know, where, how I can do these transitions sort of bouncing in backwards and forwards very yeah. simply. We can do overlays, we can do uh, pictures and pictures and so forth. There's a yeah. bit of a learning curve to it, mainly on the audio side, uh, but it is integral to the business that I do now. And uh, I'm continually adding and upgrading to the studio as well, just to uh, you know continue to to grow it. Uh, in fact, yeah. I've just come across another app called iMix 16, which is a media player, which is goes on an iPad and connects via HDMI with a whole lot of brilliant controls on it, so that you can do uh, fade to blacks um, or ju fade yeah. just audio or keep the the video running. Plus, does yeah. still images, does audio, so many different things. So I'm trialing that at the moment as a as a source. Um, you, you've got to keep learning and yeah. in this game you don't know what you don't know so yeah. you have to continue to research to learn to very swiftly assimilate and try and keep up with all the changes in the various online platforms as well uh, yeah. so there's different changes that happen in zoom and, and, and teams which is uh, mm -hmm. which actually can be a really challenging platform webex and, and the like mm. I'm just so impressed that you've yeah taken your 99% in-person MC business and then switched it into what I would consider high tech um, with yeah lots of options to do multiple different things as an MC. So I was blown away when I saw your setup because I'm like, 
you know, we we morphed into doing virtual events, and we've we did our first two virtual events without a tech company. We did them all ourselves in house using our team with our software. We've got a platform. We utilised Zoom, and it worked brilliantly. Um, so yeah, and I, my team were like, "Do we have to do this? Can we not get a tech company? This is not our like little forte." And I'm like, "But it's doable." So. Yeah, and I thought we were like, you know, when we moved virtual, I'm like, webcam, lighting, microphone. I'm like, okay, that, that that's all I need. <laughs> so, yeah, so when I saw you set up, I'm like, Greg, that's next <laughs> I've I got to say, I, I, I do enjoy my tech. Uh, you know, I, I have to be a little careful. I'm on various different groups around uh, you know on social media and one of those is remote speakers on uh, facebook oh. which is a brilliant group there's over a thousand people on that uh, on that group now worldwide uh relatively small amount of people uh continue to you know do a, do a lot of posting um i quite enjoy getting in and, and and chatting away with various various people around the world and it's the sharing really it's we, we're yeah. all we've all come in this together and and the only way we're going to get through it is by uh sharing the expertise and mm. to uh, to the vast majority of it, we're not competing. Mm. We're uh, and I've always said this: I'm I'm never competing against anyone else. The only mm. person I'm competing against is me. Am yeah. I a better person today than I was yesterday? And right. how can I get better at the job that I'm that I'm doing and provide you know continuing uh, skill and expertise to a client? Yeah. So that's that's really the, the uh, that um, that element there. And the tech yeah. is one, another one of those things. You know, can we keep on increasing it? Can we find ways to use it? And it's not—it's not just for the sake of it. You know, yeah. just going, oh, look at me, look at my great setup. Um, <laughs> it, it's not that. Everything has a purpose, and and it, it, I, I'm just continually striving for perfection, which is impossible to achieve. Yeah. But you can yeah. keep striving for it. Yeah, yeah, and as long as it's fun for you as well, as long as it's you know if, if tech's a thing that interests you and you know it makes you better at what you do and it opens doors and opportunities then you know that's that's what gives us our edge too is the things that we're interested in and how we continue to improve ourselves it opens more doors because you know it's what other people are looking for so I t I'm totally with you in there um, so where do you think going forward from here, we're still, you know, we're still um, living in a world where COVID is hugely present, even though vaccines are starting to emerge. Um, where do you think MC, virtual event, hybrid event, in-person events, what does that look like for you in the next kind of 12 months? Well, I've, I'm picturing that, that it's going to be even slightly longer than that, um, that we're going to, before there's any kind of transition back. Uh, historically, if you look at other world major events, it's kind of like a three-year cycle before anything really starts to make uh, make more sense. But I think we are going to continue virtual. Um, people have got used to it to an extent but there is still a great deal of opportunity left in that space uh, my initial thought process right at the start of 2020 was definitely around the fact that if we're on screen we're being consumed in a way very close to television and we as humans know how to consume television we've yeah. we've been watching since we were very very small yeah. but what we don't know is why we're connected to the television in such a way. And the reason is, is in how we process the visual imagery. So if you, and I'll invite you to do this, and I'll invite all the viewers to go and do this, is uh, watch the television news or watch a drama, and then simply count the number of seconds between each cut. And so mm -hmm. what you're watching for, or what you'll notice is how, how many edits there are on video when you're talking about a, a news show or when you're talking about um, drama, comedy, however it goes. In this environment, as we're sitting here, we are a talking head. Yeah. And we don't have those the uh, fast edits, which mm -hmm. are visual stimulation and the music yeah. and the emotion that goes with that television side of things. So what I've built, I've built a product, uh, which is a live stream television show which I'm uh, working with various clients on. And uh, I've got a 
fortnightly streaming show for the Building Officials Institute of New Zealand. And we do that, I've called it Breakfast with Boynes, and it is, to all intents and purposes, a 30-minute packaged live and recorded uh, TV show with as many of those elements with the visual cuts and moves and and music and uh, multi-sensory experience Mm. to be able to emulate what we see on television. And I see that Mm. as being one of the very strong focuses for me over the course of this year, uh, uh, whether it's that standalone or whether that's in conjunction with live events, the usage Mm. of video has to increase and has to be much, much better done which means upskilling. People really need to understand the drivers behind why television works and why the video Mm -hmm. side of things is so important. Mm -hmm. Hybrid definitely is going to be uh, a major player, Uh, but people have to get good at hybrid because hybrid is a very challenging beast. As a presenter, you are dealing with two very, very different audiences and you need to interact with them in very different ways. Uh, But you must understand that and you... Uh, one of the challenges is if you're talking to a live audience and you say now talk amongst yourselves now you've got an online audience that you want to talk amongst themselves as well but you have to set that up in a different way so that needs to be facilitated so what would often be now talk amongst yourselves let me just take a five minute break there's no five minute breaks anymore it's uh it's the it's the moment you start to the moment you finish um i firmly believe and i think the stats have backed this up To actually produce things in a virtual environment takes roughly three times the amount of time and three times the cost. And where clients would would actually be going, well, you're just doing it virtually, so therefore it must be uh, you know half the price or a third of the price. It's like the skill set doesn't change downwards; Mm. the skill set changed upwards, Mm. and the time factor increased. So, Mm. from a value perspective. Uh, actually right across the market, I think, in all aspects of the events industry, we've seen a lot of price pressure. Mm. And I think one of the challenges mm-hmm. there is to stand firm, stand firm on price, uh, mm. because it's not about the actual price, it's about the value that you bring to the client in every mm. single every single time. The, the monetary aspect is almost the, it's, it's secondary. It, you need it, but it's really about how you bring value to that client. And if the client doesn't value the value you bring to the client, then it's uh, you possibly want to be looking for other clients. Yeah, yeah, your 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 values are not aligned, so it's going to be a it's going to be a stretched relationship. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Greg, but we still we still have that uncertainty over over live, right? Because we, we yeah. can schedule things, but we still don't know if it's all going to go ahead, uh, even day to day. So we yeah. can only plan for what we can plan, not worry about what we can't control and just do the best job we can. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there seems to be, like I, I'm gauging at the moment, there seems to be some appetite for virtual. Um, people are just like a hybrid. Can we do hybrid? But actually the understanding behind what hybrid is, which is actually two separate events coming together, happening on the same dates and times, but they're two separate events. Um, who might be getting the same content at the same time, but they are actually two separate events with two separate audiences who need to be spoken to separately. Um, and, and how you make that together, uh, that's the delegate dance. Um, otherwise, all you're doing is streaming streaming something out, which is unengaging and uninteresting. Um who no one wants to no one wants to sit in front of their computer and watch anyway so it's yeah so that whole thought around hybrid and what that looks like and how that's delivered um to be delivered really well that's how i'm um, explaining it at the moment is actually they are two separate events with one content happening on the same day but actually how you do it is like organizing two separate events so yeah, it really is that and it increases the costs um, yeah. effectively yeah, yeah, as well, probably. of course, because you're yeah. using live environments and uh, and virtual. So. Yeah, yeah. And they don't they don't naturally speak to one another. Yeah. So excellent. I mean, I could carry on and talk to you all things business, <laughs> events, tech, like, you know, I'm secretly one of the tech geeks. 
because you know software i'm all over it like virtual events i'm like how do i do this like give me a virtual event let me add it so yeah i've been like that with virtual events on a steep learning curve and just couldn't wait to get my hands on my first one and deliver the first one and then like right got it okay now how, how can we do that better so i could talk to you all day about all of these things <laughs> But I know, I know that you have got lots of things on your plate today and you've got lots of things to go do. So before we wrap up today, I'd love to ask you, which I ask every every um, guest that I have, is what has been your aha moment in business? My aha moment in business. There's been a lot uh, mm. that has had a kind of a profound effect on me over the over the course of um, my career but the the one that really came down to me was in a process of learning learning what i know and what i don't know uh, and it came i was working as a a, a tech it tech for coopers and Librand, and we were just in the process of, of moving to pricewaterhouse coopers and because we had two tech teams in both those companies they were looking at whether or not we'd amalgamate would we downsize would we outsource and do what we like so they did a time and motion study on everybody in each of the um, it departments which can be a bit fraught and this mm. wonderful man from south africa came in and he was an it guru but he was also a philosopher and he was studying for his masters at Auckland university and one, this one night we took a server down and it had a fault and he was asking me to fix the fault so i started doing this and i couldn't fix it and i tried various different ways and couldn't fix it couldn't fix it and he said to me in a in a very broad South African accent, he says, Greg, can you fix it? And uh, it's, it's it sounds pretty confrontational. And I'm sort of like, mm, mm. he goes, Greg, can you fix it? And I uh, sort of said, I, then I told him what the problem was. He goes, no, I know what the problem is. He says, can you fix it? And I eventually sort of, he had to say no. He says, he says, it's easy. Either the answer is inside your head or it's outside your head. Which one is it? And that little moment gave yeah. me a huge amount of knowledge about what I was doing. About we, yeah, there's no point in trying to beat your head against a brick wall. If you mm -hmm. if you either know it or you don't, and being able to recognise that moment allows you to speed past all those challenges that you that you may have. And I can hear his words in my head every time I'm every time I find myself stuck in a position of not sure, not being sure or, or uh, j just not knowing necessarily which way to go. Just hear that. Is it inside your head or is it outside your head? Mm. Right. Go and find the answer. That's great. Yeah. Because there is an answer for everything. It's just, if it's not inside your head, then go look for it. Yeah. That's good. Oh, I love that. Great. Hugely. That what a lovely way to end our conversation. So thanks so much for joining me today. I have been looking forward to this conversation for a wee while because I wanted to get in behind what's going on in that studio of yours. Um, you know, and, and what's going on in virtual world of events and emceeing and values and global, global reach with MC. So we've just had this delightful conversation today so i hope everyone has learned something from our conversation and what is possible the value that they need to be looking for to embed into their events where we are now living in a world where anything is possible and everyone is looking outside the box for a solution and how they can connect differently with the audiences so thanks for being here today. I've appreciated your time so much. Oh, my absolute pleasure. And thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, I've I absolutely had a ball. And like you, I, I, the great thing about these conversations, especially in the virtual environment, means that we have an opportunity to share the experience we have, the insight that we have in mm -hmm. the hope that it will spark some kind of idea, some thought process in our viewers who will then go, ah, oh, that, yes, that's yes. what I'll do. Yeah. yeah. I appreciate Absolutely. it very much. You're welcome. All right. Thanks, Greg. I will talk to you again real soon. Kia ora. 
Okay, everyone, that was a fantastic conversation. I hope you got a takeaway from that, whatever that was that means for you. But mostly for me, I loved what Greg said at the end. If it's not inside of your brain, it is outside of your brain. So go look for the answers. I will be back here in a fortnight's time with our next guest, and we will be talking probably about sponsorship and exhibitors um, and all um, the peripheral things that need to go into a conference alongside a formal conference program. So I hope that you will join me back here in two weeks from today um, for the next conversation with a lovely person one of my colleagues and another approved professional conference organizer. Um, but that is it for today. What I would love for you to do after you have left us a wee comment to let me know what your takeaway was from today is to share this with your networks. So if you're watching on LinkedIn, share it with your networks on LinkedIn, share it with your networks on uh, Facebook or snap it onto Instagram or tweet it out on Twitter. However you do social media, please share the Oaha Live episodes so we reach more people and we help those that are in those that are organizing events get some insight to help improve and level up the businesses that business events that we do here. If you want to be notified about our next show, you can join our Facebook page, join our LinkedIn page, or you can hop over to our website, oaha.co.nz, sign up for our newsletter, and we will drop a little email into your inbox so you know what to expect next. But I appreciate you for joining us here today and joining us every week. Uh, until next time, Matewa.